We're good. Yay. All right. Hello, everybody. Woo! Welcome to the very first Drupal NYC meetup of 2019. Here we are. It's January 2nd. Thank you all for coming uh, on this very, um, uh, on this very January day. I don't know. It's very, uh, it's neither too cold nor too hot nor whatever. <laughs> okay. My name is Alex Ross. For those of you who don't know me, I will be your host this evening. Um, here we are in 30 Rock and uh, let's start our show. Okay, some quick housekeeping. Please mute any devices that you've got. Um, if you have questions, uh, things are going to go a little different today, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you have questions, if you want to participate in the conversations, please do your best to try and use the mics. Um, that's especially important because we are recording, and uh, we put these up on the YouTubes and various other places. Um, and we want to make sure that, uh, that the questions and the conversation um, are easily uh, accessed by those watching, as well as everybody in the room. Uh, restrooms, we have some of those. Um, they're at the other end of the floor. I used to do. A, I used to have pictures and everything, but someone removed my slide and made it more boring. Um, oh, it's the next slide. No, it's not. <laughs> it's unnecessary. We're going to keep going. Um, all right, connect, connect with us. Uh, we're on Twitter, Drupal NYC. We're on uh, Slack. We have Drupal NYC. Slack. Com. Um, all of the uh, the the the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for here. The, no, the people who are um, organizing, the organizers, we're all there on the, on the Slack channel. Um, so please do uh, come in there. And we do have a meetup channel, but we we purpose we purposely didn't invite Monty, so we're good. Um, but yeah, but but please do come in there, have some good conversation, ask some questions. Um, it's a really good resource. It's a good way to, to kind of uh, converse with all your fellow uh, Drupal NYC uh, folks. All right, uh, agenda today. So we're doing the announcements right now, and we'll go through that. Um, today is a little different than, than normal. We do this probably once, maybe twice a year. We do more of an unconference style meetup, where rather than having a specific topic where someone has prepared slides ahead of time, we kind of have a more informal set of conversations um, uh, where you know people say, "Hey, what do I want to talk about? What do I? What am I interested in these days? What do I have going on?" And uh, what questions do I have? And other people say, oh, I can answer that question. I think that's a really you know, fantastic uh, uh, point of conversation. We should talk about that. And we figure it out. So we'll spend a couple of minutes to, to decide what we're going to talk about in our unconference, unconference style. Um, uh, we'll do that shortly. And, uh, and we'll see what, uh, what kind of topics we're going to go over today. Uh, and then uh, closing remarks, which is usually me saying, you know, get out of here. And um, and then there's an after party tonight sponsored by Fastly at Bill's Bar and Burger downstairs. You enter on 51st Street. Um, so yeah, there we go. All right, today's topics unconference. So I already started talking about this a little bit. So if we're gonna have some sticky notes, um, if you have a particular topic that you're very interested in either talking about or hearing about, um, please do uh, write that down on the sticky notes. We'll come around, we'll collect it, we'll do a little bit more, you know, figuring out how that's gonna work. We'll, we'll group them together and, uh, and do some, uh, some voting on, on which topics we want to talk about. And then we'll, we're going to talk about it. So that's how it's going to work. Um, our, our good pal John over here is, uh, is passing them out. There are stickies if you need a pen or something. The stickies are purple in honor of Barney for no reason. Um, my two-year-old is like super into Barney right now, but he can't say the R. He said Barney, Barney. All right, uh, your Drupal organizers. Um, so these are your Drupal organizers. Uh, please do uh, take note. Uh, some of us are in the room today. Oh, I know. I'm going to talk about you in just a minute. Um, please do take note of the organizers in the room. We love to hear feedback from you folks. We love to hear what we could do better, what topics you'd love to hear about, all that good stuff. So if you see, uh, if you see one of the organizers uh, uh, come up and, and say hi and, uh, and let us know what's going on and what you're thinking in regards to this meetup. I will point out, for those of you who don't know, that this is Mani. This is his last Drupal NYC meetup. So we will be unceremoniously removing his face from this slide as quickly as we can. Um, and I'm a little, it's a little annoying because I finally learned how to both say and write his last name correctly. It took me, I've known you now for what, seven years, something like that. And I finally got it down and now he's leaving. So, um, but yeah, but Monty, Monty's going to, uh, to Canada. He, uh, he, he's uh, going to become a Canuck. Next time we see him, he'll be, you know, riding a horse with a Mountie costume on. That's, that's the plan, right? Yeah, eh? 
right, Mani A? Okay, but yeah, but good luck to Mani. We're all very sad that you're going to be going, but we've been happy to have you here. You're welcome back anytime, maybe. Um, okay, so that's our organizers. Uh, venue Food and Drink, sponsored by our good friends here at NBC Universal. Yay! Thank you, NBC Universal. Um, and our after party sponsored by Fastly. Yay! Sponsored by our good friends at Fastly. Um, all right, so uh, uh, thank you to both of those groups for, for making sure that we have a good place to do this and we have some uh, uh, some beverages later. I, I think voting is going to go really easy on this one so far. Come on, no one has topics they want to talk about. All right, we'll get we'll get more in a minute. Start 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 padding the padding the election here. Um, all right, photos and hashtags. We have uh, uh, a hashtag hashtag Drupal NYC, which we typically use. Uh, if you, yeah, what's going on? No, you don't need a laptop to present anything. You just talk. I mean, if you have something to present, then you present. We'll talk more about it in a minute. But if you have a topic that you'd like to talk about, whether you have a laptop or not, please, you know, be forthcoming. Let's hear it. Um, okay. If you take any photos, I saw someone, you know, you were taking pictures over there. Please uh, 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 share them with the hashtag DrupalNYC. Um, and and make your friends and neighbors jealous that they were not here. Um, uh, please support the Drupal Association. Our good friends at the Drupal Association make sure that the Drupal community is healthy. They make sure that we, we have Drupal.org. They they help with uh, with organizing conferences and camps and all that good stuff. Making sure that the word gets around about Drupal and all the good stuff that it's doing. Um, it, it's possible to help support Drupal Association as an individual contributor. You could just, you know, kind of become a member. You can get your company to become a, a company supporter. Um, but it really does help the, the project as a whole, the community as a whole. So please, please, please um, do as you can to support the Drupal Association. All right. Join us on Slack. I heard that Slack's IPO is coming. Hmm, I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like they're waiting to introduce the feature where you can say, remind me on the first Wednesday of every month until their IPO hits as like their first killer new feature. Because right now you can just say, remind me every Wednesday, and it's terrible. OK. Um, but we are on Slack, drupal.nyc slash Slack. Please do join us there. Um, and uh, yeah, OK. Upcoming events. There are several of them. Uh, late January is the Drupal Global Contribution Weekend. Uh, there are lots of locations for this all over the country, all over the world. It's, it's, it's global. They probably have one in Canada. Um, and uh, uh, we do encourage you. It's a great way to kind of get involved with contributing to Drupal if you haven't done that before. Um, there, are, um, there are like kind of specific, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Processes. No, that's the word. There's specific things that are set up for new people, right? There's specific paths set up if you're new to contributing. Um, and it's a great way to kind of get involved in that if you haven't done it before. If you have done it before, it's a great way to like, hey, I haven't contributed anything in a while. I'll just spend the weekend. I'll spend an, you know, a day, an hour, a couple hours, and I'll, I'll work on, uh, on some part of the, of the project or on some contrib module or something like that. So please do get involved there. First week of February, Drupal Camp and New, Drupal Camp New Jersey uh, at Princeton. Um, so uh, DrupalCampNJ.org. Um, they do a great job down in Jersey, so if you can make it down there, um, please do. Um, February 15th, Florida Drupal Camp, um, fldrupal.camp. Uh, they're, they're I, I think that's the first time in real life I've seen someone use the .camp TLD, but there it is. Um, so uh, book your tickets now, right? It'll be nice and warm down there. Um, and uh, what's that? We should get drupalnyc.camp, you're right. You should you should talk to someone about that. Yeah, that's probably the right someone. Yeah, there she. Okay. Um, uh, in addition, and it's not up on the list, but it's coming up somewhat soon in April. Uh, DrupalCon North America. It's coming. Uh, this year it's in Seattle, Washington. Um, so uh, if you need to like plan your budget for the year, plan to go to Seattle. It's a little. Little little camp. You and three thousand and five hundred of your closest friends can uh, meet and, and do Drupal-y things in Seattle. Um, but there's always uh, the the drupacal.com site and then groups.drupal.org/events. Always kind of talks about the different events that are going on. Okay. 
Uh, interested in speaking. So um, we're always interested in getting new speakers. We're always interested in new topics. We're also interested in people who want to help organize you know, one of these camps. Uh, someone suggested recently that we, we kind of have people who can, if you can't dedicate, you know, every month, you're going to help organize one of the, um, uh, I'm not one of the camps, one of these uh, meetups. If you can't dedicate, you know, your, your time to do that every month, maybe you could do it for one meetup or two meetups. Um, that would be extremely helpful in helping us kind of um, get the, sp the speakers together, get the topics together, make sure that we have good content. So if you're interested, please do talk to one of the uh, organizers and we will happily um, help figure that out. We don't have exactly all the details, you know, lined up in a row as to how we're going to do that, um, but we are positive that we could always use the help, and we would love to have people who are are um, are willing to help, you know, with one or two meetups, or if you want, if you're able to dedicate the time and, and and do it for a while, that's great too. So please, you know, talk to the organizers. All right, who's hiring? That's my five-year-old, but now he's six years old, so I need to change the picture. Um, who's hiring? Mr. Fisher. Uh, I work for uh, Teodi, which is a Drupal or just general digital agency based out of Washington, D.C., and our entire developer department works remotely. So if you're uh, either a full stack or a back-end dev, either one of those, we need them badly. We're looking for like a lot of devs in a short amount of time because we have a lot of work coming. So if you're looking to work remotely, talk to me. There we go. Anybody else want to make a quick pitch? Oh, once, twice. Hi, I'm John. Most of you know me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm launching DevShop Cloud and DevShop Support and looking for co-founders, non-technical co-founders, <laughs> investors, Super friendly Drupal experts. That's uh, that's everything. Yeah, that's a pretty broad. Yeah, that's that's fairly broad. Yes, one non-technical Drupal expert with a lot of money to invest. Anyone, anyone. I'm looking at you, Neil. All right, no, okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. My voice is going. A non-technical Drupal expert. Yeah. I just thought of a mean joke that I'm not going to say because it's mean. Okay. Uh, introdu introductions. Introduce yourself. Introductions. Um, take a few minutes. Introduce yourself to somebody who's sitting near you who you don't know. And everybody come up with another topic they'd like to talk about. And freeze. So hopefully I did that at the exact moment you were at the best part of the conversation you were just having so that you will try to continue said conversation later at drinks at Bill's Bar. Okay, uh, next meetup. We are going to have the next meetup at, uh, at right here in this room on Wednesday, February 6th um, in, uh, in, in at same bat channel, same bat time, same bat station. Um, so mark your calendars, tell your friends. Everybody's job is to bring three friends with them to the meetup next week, or next month. All right. Um, call for speakers and organizers and members. Yeah, uh, I kind of mentioned this already, but we would love to hear from more people um, we'd love feedback. We'd love more speakers. We'd love to hear what people would like, like to, to talk about and, and, and hear and, and have in these meetups. So please, please, please uh, come let us know. Go on Slack. Talk to the organizers. Go to Drupal NYC slash suggest and let us know what you like. Um, I think now we're at the, yeah, that, that'll, we'll, we'll come back to this slide after we do this. Or is there a slide for this? Is there a slide for this? Hold on. No, there isn't one. Yeah, we just took it out. No way. No way. This is the last slide. This is the last slide. Oh, well, then I skipped it. Did I skip the slide? Okay. Any slides? Hiring. Excuse me. Upcoming events. It really doesn't. But I'm going to keep doing this until I get an appropriate slide. There we go. Here's all the ideas. Open source sustainability. I'm going to read through them first and then we'll vote. That's only fair. Future of Drupal. 
What does NYPL do with Drupal? Holing will speak on. Launch Drupal servers with Drupal. I can talk about accessibility, tools, or content management. Introduction to Golang, and how do you host 6,000 Drupals, Mani? <laughs> okay. How many do we have? I have a lot. Uh, do, should we do applause or something? How do we? <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you want to hear Mani talk about how he hosts 6,000 plus websites. Raise your hands if you want to hear that. Okay, that's a winner. All right, raise your hand if you want to hear about accessibility. All right, that's a winner too. Actually, they're all winners, I think. No, no, we'll do four. How about that? Four? Huh? Count the, count the hands? Okay, those were clear winners, but after this, it's going to get close. Uh. <laughs> Open source sustainability. Show hands. Open source sustainability. Does the submitter want to elaborate? Okay, wait, we got five or four. So count. So you voted for yourself. <laughs> Did you count? I, well, I, I didn't count. I just was with. <laughs> Open source sustainability. Raise them up high. <laughs> okay. Future of Drupal. That's different? Show of hands. Count, counter? I'll count. One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, what does the New York Public Library do with Drupal? Many interesting case study, real, real world stuff. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I like that one. Eight. Introduction to Golang. One, two, three, four. Good for you, Golang. Hanging in there. All right. Well, I think Jacob, we're going to only let you do one, so we're going to give you the future of Drupal. And uh, there you go. All right. There you go. For the four winners, how do you host 6,000 Drupals, Mani? These don't have to be long. It's just Odin Conference. Only wait. And uh, you, you do have to, you do get to present if you win. You know, they're going to force you. <laughs> Would you speak on that? I can, uh, the accessibility talk. Sweet. Future Drupal and what does NYPL do with Drupal? So since Monty's leaving, I'll let you pick. Do you want to go first or last or somewhere in the middle? Later. Okay. We'll make them last. So you got really got to kill it. You got to be really awesome at the end. Okay. How about Jake? Future of Drupal. <laughs> we're going to go through them, and we don't know how long they're going to be, so we're just going to go for it. How about Holing? Will you start us off, Holing? Ladies and gentlemen, Holing from the New York Public Library. <laughs> So uh, to, to start off with, my name is Holing Pu, and I am a senior DevOps engineer for the New York Public Library. Uh, basically, what I do is that all the public-facing web infrastructure, it needs to stay up 99% of the time. <laughs> so so that, that would, that's my job. But uh, I also spend um, some years uh, uh, 
So I joined New York Public Library since 2014. I started off as an applications developer. So I started off as a coder, and now I'm working on operations side of things. No, that is still pointing back to the other That's interesting. Please stand by as we're resolving our technical difficulties. Dun, do, 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 do. Uh, that, that is an interesting question. Let's see. Let's go over this. Um, we still have, I believe, one or two Drupal 6 websites. So here, here's a very short history of how we switch over to uh, Drupal in general. Um, a little bit before um, my time, um, if anybody knows, MIPL.org has been around since 1997, at the beginning of the internet. So you, you will see like uh, those really cool Perl scripts, uh, <laughs> CGI scripts with a little, um, the little map that gives you like the three different boroughs, like the, the Bronx, um, Manhattan, and Staten Island, and then you can click on it. That was like 1999. If you go back to web archives, it's there. And then um, th that was static for a very, very long while. And sometime around 2010, they have decided that uh, the, the library decided that they need a CMS because otherwise the content are the the base use cases. There are 92 locations, so it's four research libraries and 88 branch libraries, and it doesn't make sense to someone having to call the central branch all the time and say that okay we have a more water main break and it's closing. Then they have to update the web and do it that way. So uh, we need to cover maybe like two or 300 users between the 92 locations so that if they need to do a static update, they can do it, log in, go into the node that they need to update, bang, in, out, just like that. So in 2010, they did a lot of shopping. There were a few contenders. I, I think, well, Drupal uh, and ended up being the more prominent one because at that time, Drupal 6 covers most, if not all, the functionalities that the New York Public Library needed. So they switched over to Drupal 6, and then you will also see like the bigger um, uh, slideshows and the uh, and and the and the big banners that you see, but sometime in the in the 2010s, and uh, they did a direct port over from uh, Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 sometime around 2014, a little bit before I arrived. Um, and that's pretty much the short history. So we're still running Drupal 7 for a lot of reasons because it was a, a lot, it was non-trivial amount of work. And it was, it, it involves um, it's, uh, technical and non-technical person. Uh, uh, it's, it's anywhere between, the, there was a picture where they migrated from static to Drupal 6 and that picture has easily 20, 30 people in it. It was a 30-man job, full-time, for, for the, the, the minus the planning phases, the execution phase was 18 months. So the, any time that they need to do a migration, the migration that they did from six to seven was a year, which was also why we were very gun-shy of dedicating all our resources for 12 straight months because we have all these other projects that we have to answer to. And that's why we have been not necessarily digging our heels, but every single time when we say, let's do another upgrade, we're like, wait a minute, let's look at how many projects we have right now before we say yes. So we're back, at the most up-to-date that I've heard is that we're back at looking at our current CMS, 
and see one, if we need another CMS or uh, the, uh, we're looking at our content and see what, what is the best to serve our content. So we're still in another discovery phase, but that was like 2014 was the direct port. We're now at 2019. So we're, we're doing, we're cycling up again. It's like, it's like a four year election. You have a new president and then you, you just kind of keep going. So that's the status of um, what, uh, where Drupal is right now with us in general. Uh, if, um, if my computer is be behaving, <laughs> I can actually show you what we did, um, what, what we did and, uh, without Drupal 8 because what happens was that we started decoupling our sites uh, sometime after I arrived, which is around 2014. Um, our, uh, I'm, a, I'm a backend developer for, for what it's worth and then um, what uh, the front end devs does was uh, let's start decoupling the site, but our site is just large. Uh, if you log into, or not even log into MIPR, just go to MIPR.org and you click on it, it looks like one site, but in reality, it, just the subdomains themselves, we have 87 subdomains and all 87 of those subdomains are not referring to the same app. Um, so we, we were trying to figure out how, how we do it and in 2014, decoupled architecture was not even a term. We were just trying to figure out how we can um, give our front end devs um, the flexibility of just looking at the API. We want the front end devs to just do API calls and render their content their own way. So what uh, we ended up doing was we started harvesting what's from Drupal and then convert it into an API that the front end devs can use and they did, um, the app is still up there. Our very first decoupled app is the locations, they, where the 92 locations is, the, the index, the directory, and the map. And it is done in Angular 1. So that, that was our first try. And then the front end devs uh, got, got a taste of it and say that, oh, hey, th this is great because now we have the flexibility. So what we did piecemeal at that point was then React came along and uh, the front end apps were go going through it and say that maybe React will work a little bit better for us. And then we have another series of uh, different applications that got decoupled. So the second app that was done, which is in React, was a uh, staff profiles. It's a very, you need to dive a little bit deeper, but what they did was it was the, the first try on the single page application and that kind of worked. And they, they love React. So what uh, we ended up doing was that uh, it was still in Drupal 7. Drupal 8 has like a vast um, API support, especially now, even though in, in the first phase it was just a RESTful layer, but it was kind of not working for us because we have a lot of Drupal specific data when it's done on the, on the API. And what uh, uh, the brilliant uh, Kevin Freeman did was let's write a middle tier. So there's a PHP app and we call it the refinery. It's just spewing out JSON. But what it does is that it has a, we, we, wrote, a, uh, we wrote a module for Drupal to harvest the data from the Drupal 7 layer and then um, feed it into the PHP app, which uh, comes back out as JSON objects. Then we have API endpoints and the, the, the data that comes out, it's not Drupal specific. It was something that we want to expand our um, API nice. base. You call a wall and wall. What's short of a wall though in terms of border security and you willing to accept it? Build that wall! No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's going to be on YouTube forever. Okay. Um, so so um, we create a middle tier without Drupal 8. And it was, um, oh, hey, no, that's not it. Sorry. Make you look. Um, so uh, so what, what we ended up doing was we continue to harvest all, all, the, all the different data objects that we see in um, Dr Drupal 7. And, um, uh, and that was pretty much it. Then there are uh, a series of other uh, de decoupled applications that doesn't read from Drupal because we have a very vast catalog. So uh, we also have new arrivals. We also have, sorry. We, we also have like uh, uh, 
best books, uh, where the, or also known as staff picks, where the staff uh, gets to pick by season. Like we, we, we go out there four times a year and ask all our librarians what's good out there to read. And that uh, also, like once we start decoupling things, we thought about like how, how many data sources we can read from. It, um, and we also like, we read it from spreadsheets, we read it from other data sources. We also have like even more ambitious projects where there's this particular project called Recap and what Recap does is that we're, uh, we are out in New Jersey and there is this warehouse that we share with uh, Princeton and Columbia. And there are these rare books, like really rare first edition books that people can still check out and read in the research library branches, but it's out in New Jersey. And they have a state of the armor body grumbling. <laughs> and what, what we did was we have to write our own interface to access that catalog. And that turned out to be another React app uh, we call uh, uh, share, uh, share Collections Catalog. So uh, that's, uh, sorry to go off on a tangent, but I'm just saying that we don't only just do Drupal. We, we do a lot of, uh, we, we're go, going forward with a lot of the decoupled architecture. Um, where are we with Drupal 8? Um, we have people that try to uh, pitch as hard as we can with Drupal 8 and that um, exploratory committee to figure out that like should we upgrade to Drupal 8 versus uh, picking another CMS or do we write our own? So that's where we're at. Uh, I was hoping I can show you some really cool things of like how uh, the, the things travel from hitting the save button in Drupal in the content editing feeds it into a refinery and then goes back out to React. But, uh, We'll come out with some other time. This is like my first try for this talk. If anybody is interested and would like me to elaborate, I'll figure out how to write a talk. So thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, sorry. Hang on. Hang on for the mic. No, actually, we we are going to record it on YouTube. So please. Oh, yeah. This is more informational. Um, why do people want to read first editions? Why can't they read the microfiche? Um, on the, on, I can only speak for this one library called the New York Public Library. <laughs> we've, we've been trying as hard as we can to digitize all of the rare finds, and there's a separate uh, application called digitalcollections.mipl.org. Uh, it's not a Drupal app, it's a Ruby app. Uh, our, our stack is fast, but there are times where we don't digitize fast enough. The, uh, we, we already have like a, there's a dedicated team. We have seven or eight photographers uh, in charge of like different document cameras, but we're still not digitizing fast enough. We, we try to do maybe, uh, depending on how big the collection is, anywhere from 15 if they're like really large co collections or maybe hundreds of them in a year. But they're, they're all planned out and we're trying to push as hard as we can, so there you go. If you ever held a rare first edition in your hands, you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't have to ask that question. It's something about holding that book that's 100, 150 years old, and it's just made differently and smells differently. And, it's, and they usually have ornate um, drawings and illustrations in them. I mean, books used to be a, a production once upon a time. Yeah. Um, I just want you guys to know you can still get the, uh, lim well, not getting your hands onto it, but you can see the f uh, first edition of Mary Poppins. The, uh, there, there, was a, there was a video from CBS ta talking about it uh, with their interview with uh, Emily, Emily Blunt. They actually went there and uh, saw these like rare fine objects on 42nd Street, so. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I've got a question about uh, the 87 websites, uh, applications that the NYPL yes. has. Yes. Uh, that correlates pretty closely to the branch libraries. Did branch libraries have their own websites or is that all centralized and it's just like? Right now they're centralized at uh, locations. .mypl.org. The 87 subdomains is actually not necessarily from all the locations. We have, uh, we, uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, Schomburg for uh, African American Studies, which is located in Harlem, they they do have like a good good amount of donors. Like uh, the, uh, we we have a bunch of sites that are still in um, 
flash, but <laughs> that's because we were, oh, here we go. Uh, we, we were very short staffed for, for a while. So that was outsourced and it's still out there. We, but all the content are important. We're not taking any of them down. So that kind of leads to like, this is going to be a completely separate talk of like what, what are the challenges that we have facing? Because uh, a lot of these contents, we have no intention of taking them down. The only reason why that they may be down is because um, the, uh, the way we have like technical limitations, but we're, we're still trying to sit down and figure out how, what are we going to do with old content? Because just because the content is no uh, old, it doesn't mean that it's uh, irrelevant. So we're, we're trying to revamp a lot of those sites. So yeah. Any other questions? So yeah, I'm, I'm astounded that, that uh, uh, writing your own CMS is still an option for you. I mean, you some uh, you somebody know, I mean, said it. I told them that th it's uh, the first thing to do is: do we still have access for the 300 users that needs to update the site? Because I can quickly show you right now what's involved with, like, for example, this is an actual blog post. So. It's, it's Drupal, this is the Drupal backend, and we kind of like figure out where it gets published, we hit save, right? And then uh, the refinery would pick up the uh, post and then massage it into this non, not Drupal specific uh, JSON object. So you, you would see that it's like there's a full body and everything. So that by the time you get to it, you can see like, it, it, this is the React app where it get it, it takes all, all the content and then it renders on its own. So, whoop, technical difficulties. But uh, here is the yeah that that's basically then it turns out then it, it renders into this. So that that was my really short demo <laughs> of of uh, decouple sites. So um, any other questions? Thank you. Uh, so you had said in like 2010, I think it was, that you made the move to Drupal. Um, yes. Is what were you using before, or what was NYPL using before that for the catalog system? Uh, it has its own third-party catalog. It's still a third-party system. We uh, we talked to a place called Triple I. I think it stands for Innovative. Um, in into library, I'm bad with acronyms, but uh, there is a company who's in charge of uh, just our catalog, but it is in charge of every aspect of the catalog from the but from the first time the book is being bought from the publisher to where does it travel, where does it go to, the check-in, check-out system, the reserve system. Uh, it's, been, it's been outsourced to this uh, third party since um, maybe the early 2000s, but before that, back in the 90s, the library actually had their own catalog system. There were seven or eight coders just dedicated to cataloging. So, wow. Yeah. So like today when they scan the books, when people check them in, does that automatically connect right to the catalog system, the Drupal site? Or is um, it like an intermediary layer? There is an intermediary layer between Drupal and the actual catalog system. So uh, the, the catalog system has, has its own complete full um, database and everything. It's, it's called the ILS, it's called the interlibrary systems. Um, lots of libraries use it, it's not just us. I think NYU uses it, um, just to name a few. Um, that, that, uh, and then we harvest data from that API, which pretty much uh, is what, um, how should I describe this, let's see. This is another um, front-end app. Um, it doesn't read from Drupal because what we ended up doing, whoops. Let's see if this comes back up. Oh, oh here we go. So uh, this is from the catalog. There is <laughs> the, the new arrival is a little bit shy. We'll have you back for a full presentation yes. on this, yeah? Yep, I'll come back with a full presentation, but thank you. Real quick, it's up again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Holang. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jake's not here, so I guess the accessibility. 
No, we no, neither did we. No, no one here prepared. <laughs> uh, yeah, just talk about what you do or whatever. Or just yeah. Okay, I've also never presented before, so if I end up back here in a fetal position crying, that's why. No. We'll pick. We'll pick you up. Just roll so. me out. It'll be okay. Okay, accessibility. I work at the UN. My name is Kim. And I'm actually not going to discuss some of the stuff we do at the UN because a lot of it is not very accessible. Um, and the reason I got into really into accessibility is I feel there's a lot of doors that have been opened just because people made slight accommodations for me. And I know you don't really notice it, but you know I'm slightly hearing impaired, and people know to speak facing me and to speak slower, I speak four different languages. People know to speak to me simply in those languages or I will not understand a word. But there are so many things that you go through every single day where people accommodate what you're doing. And I like just being inclusive. I like that other people have assisted me. I also feel like with accessibility, there are tons of things that make it a great website once it becomes more accessible. For example, like if you are looking at a video and you want to look at it on the subway and you don't have your headphones. Everybody uses subtitles all the time now. And this is something that was developed for hearing impaired people. Slightly inebriated me when I want to go order some more wine. Really appreciates when a website has been made very simple for somebody who has some sort of learning disability or shakes a little bit and can't access a website you know, easily. So these are accommodations that have been made for accessibility. But there's a lot of things we also tend to ignore, and these are the big things I want to focus on. Namely, like if you go to a lot of the UN websites, they are written like this. It is in the Resolution 72 249 of 24 December 2017. The GA decided to convene an intergovernmental conference under the auspices of the United Nations. It's hard to understand, it's impossible to translate. Anybody with learning disability coming into these websites. Actually, a learning disability would probably have to have it translated for them. But this is also super common that a lot of these websites are written in a very convoluted manner. The UN loves to use the passive tense. It is passing of a law or something like that. And so a lot of what we see is actually written for people who have absolutely no learning disabilities that speak English flawlessly, that don't need this translated. Um, so I can talk about tools sometimes for, you know, how we, um, actually, let me plug in this one thing. That's okay. Um, I think it's okay. It's an error, so it has, like, the older one going. It's okay. <laughs> um, but so... The other thing with accessibility, too, is I think people always think it's sort of icing on the cake that you're, you know, programming for the majority of people and you don't want to think of these, you know, one or two little offshoots that you have to develop for. But that's actually now sort of not the case. In fact, they've decided that more than 50% of people at some point will need some accommodations online. And so it could just be like a scalable font or it could be that, you know, you can't use one of your arms and you need to like jump through it. We also have now, by 2050, the population that is considered elderly is supposed to as much as triple. So these are people that will need reading glasses and everything else, just making the site accessible to them. And of course, you know, now we use mobile phones and everything else much more, so there's a lot of that. Um, but the stats for this are pretty crazy too. Just the amount of ADA Title III federal lawsuits from 2017 to 18 has, um, is increased 30%. So 30% more lawsuits, um, just because these sites and everything are not accessible. Um, but so it really is something now that goes beyond like using a reader or blindness or color contrast, or those, those are issues as well. Um, but we now have in the US, 8.2% of people have issues lifting or grasping or a tremor where they can't use a mouse. 6.3 have cognitive, mental, or emotional impairment. This means it's difficult, if not impossible, to read UN websites. Um, and 3.3 have a vision impairment that makes it difficult to read online. 3.1 have a hearing impairment, which means they do have to use the titles, the closed captioning on videos when they have those. 
And so this is no longer like a you know, small issue, and part is we're recognizing it more, and we have more tools to work with it, so it is possible to do this. Um, and I would like to do a full presentation on this, particularly on the tools. Like Drupal 8 has some of the best tools where it just comes out of the box, it's extremely accessible, and so many of the themes now have requirements where just from the get-go, they're very accessible. Um, but I will do a full presentation on it eventually, just. <laughs> Um, this one was unfortunately doing, done sitting there waiting. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, wait, we need a microphone, sorry. I'm just curious, is there with Drupal 8 like uh, some kind of a compliance testing tool where you can just run it, run the site through a thing and it tells you like if it complies with one of the major tests? Yeah, there's a lot of different tools they have. In fact, they have one where you can actually test your content for how accessible it is. So there's, um, and I can't remember the name of the module offhand, but it will look at the content in a text box and there's an accessibility thing that will tell you you need an alt tag on this image that has been added. It will tell you if your um, table is structured correctly um, and I'll get you the name of that while, when the next presentation is going on, but there's a lot of other accessibility features too that are really great in Drupal 8, and it's much more extensive than um, in 7, and there's also just a lot of web tools that, where you can run that page through um, a website to see if it's accessible. The issue I have with that is I find it catches a lot of things like color contrast and stuff like that, but it doesn't catch things like, for example, if you have an image that's just meant to assist the website to make it look pretty, it needs to be labeled accordingly. Um, there's a lot of things where it will repeat the title, then the alt tag, and then you'll also have a name for the image. And so a reader will actually become sort of aggravating. And it doesn't pick up on things like that. It's picking up on the more compliance-oriented issues. Yes. I have a question. So the accessibility standards and the, the various things you have to consider obviously continue to evolve just like everything else mm -hmm. on the web does. How much of this really could be handled within the browsers if the browsers modified the, the pages, thus making everybody's website more accessible? Yes, I, that is definitely possible. And in particular, the idea of translation is a very obvious example. Mm -hmm. But again, the content has to be extremely clear and concise, and you want that you're not saying it's raining cats and dogs, that it's raining hard. And so you have to teach content um, managers how to do this. And also with things like, you know, even a browser would not be able to interpret if you have an image and you've labeled that image very carefully with an extremely long, you know, alt tag <laughs> or something. So there's things like that you can't really, you know, figure out you know, a browser's mm -hmm. not going to figure out. But there yeah. are a lot of things that, yes, it could do that. And there are certain things too, like um, there's a site that I'm developing now for Bees Without Borders, where we actually have, you can switch over to a special font. That Sorry, for Peas Without Borders? Bees. 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 Oh, the bees. The UN has a beekeeper, oh, okay. actually, so. Oh, no, this is fine. I mean, we're just, okay. Um, <laughs> But so um, there are things like that where they'll, they would definitely like, you know, be able to translate it, but we're, have it where it switches over to a font that is easier to read for dyslexics. And it's mm. a very ugly font, so I don't want it to just put on the website. Right, like Comic Sans is yeah, easy to dyslexic. Yeah, and so you could, <laughs> yeah. And so there, there are things you could do, even make your website where people could switch over to different things and make it accessible. And browsers mm. help a lot too. But you still have to have, you know, a human looking at a lot of this. Yeah, thank you. So maybe is the answer. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I, I agree with you. I think accessibility is a huge issue. I was actually running a, a Drupal, uh, a small uh, Drupal shop for a number of years and left and uh, eight months ago started a company specifically focused on, on web accessibility because mm -hmm. uh, about 90% of most of the websites out there are really not accessible. Uh, you could look at Fortune 1000s, Fortune 1500s. Most of their sites are sort of built uh, completely inaccessible. Um, and we're actually building some automated tools, so if there's anybody interested, 
we're sort of fine tuning our algorithm, so we're looking for uh, beta prospects. So if anybody's out there and would like free audits or uh, free help with accessibility, we're we're certainly looking for uh, some customers to uh, uh, help us hone hone uh, our ability. Uh, but generally speaking, I think you're right. Um, uh, you know, browsers can do some things, but if an image has no alt text and mm. there's really no AI around that, you know, it's up to content editors as well as programmers. It's one of the unique things about a, a website where um, content editors and developers really need to work together. So yes. if a button, you know, doesn't have the right alt text around it and it's just labeled as button, you know, a screen reader will just read that as button. It would be no different than, you know, going into an elevator and reading the elevator, you know, exactly. braille and would say, you know, button rather than the floor that you want to go to. And you can actually, on a Mac, it is that sort of like looping thing. If you press that plus F5, um, it'll show you how screen readers read your website. And on some of them, it's just, it's horrible. It's right. so, to me, it's completely irritating to listen to it and particularly if you have information that's repeating on something. And also, um, Google now ranks your website higher if it's very accessible. And so I was working on um, the website for a glass blowing company, which I can't imagine a lot of blind people are going in there and using it, but you never know. And we right. made it much more accessible and it did increase their, their Google ranking. And so it's something where, of course, they're going through and just like looking at it like a robot would. They're not having people read out all the information. And so, I mean, that's also a big advantage, too, is you can get better SEO ratings from complying with that. More questions? All right. Thank you very much. This is going to be a little blinky, but we're going to get through it somehow. Huh? It's going to be blinky? Oh. What, it's going to be blinky? Be Is that what you said? It's like on and off the HDMI. Oh. Yeah. It's unacceptable. Yeah, so we just connect What are we paying you for? Sorry? Nothing. Mm. <laughs> Rockefeller Center was built in 1939. That's right. Look, it's, we're on the road with Jack Kerouac. Here we go, everybody. Da -na 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 -na. Yeah, that's not a, a that, that's Warner Brothers. Slow down. <laughs> yeah. What do do we do we have do we have odds on 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 how long it's going to take Disney to get them to pass a uh, copyright extension again for Mickey Mouse? It's coming up in three years, four years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's going to be an interesting one. No. But there was recently, in, in, in 2019 is the first time new things came into the public domain in the United States in about 20 years. Because the last extension that they did created this weird window of nothing coming into the public domain for 20 years, or 10 years, something, a long period of time. And this is the first year since they did that that things have caught up. So, all right, we're good? We're good. All right, Docker, Dockerizing right. Drupal. Money, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, this is a really old presentation I made in 2014. Uh, I presented at Nice Camp, and I have not updated this. I apologize for that. So uh, a lot of it is going to be winging it. And it's not 1,000 sites. We have like 6,000 plus now. Um, so my name is Mani Soundarajan. Um, I'm a technical architect at Sindhuit. And uh, I'm going to go into sort of the uh, how we did the architecture to do thousands of Drupal websites. Um, so before we get into this, they're all the same code base, very, very similar websites um, that are very templatized and like a customer can change a few things. So it's not like 6,000 different projects. Don't look at it as a project. It's more like a SaaS product. And the way we deliver the SaaS product is every customer gets a Drupal site. And then we had like a, a dashboard where they can control things and also built in Drupal. So think of it like a SaaS product and a really easy way to do a minimum viable version built on Drupal. 
right? So like a customer signs up, we spin up a new Drupal site, and then that's their environment. Uh, gives you complete isolation, maybe not the best way to achieve your SaaS product, but for MVP, it really worked well. We were able to scale up to 6,000 customers. Now we are re-architecting, but we got to a really good place. 6,000 customers, like, not bad uh, to run on this architecture. Um, so they're really old, and uh, probably a lot of you already know about Docker. I can skip over some of these slides. So sh should we go into Docker at all, or? Okay. okay. All right, okay, All yeah. Right. So, um, how much time do we have? Okay, so, okay, how many of you don't know about Docker? Oh yeah, okay. All right, okay. So, um, so Docker is um, a container system, right? So, as compared to, you would uh, contrast that to a virtual machine. Um, in the cloud. So on the virtual machine, you are operating the entire machine, uh, whereas Docker gives you a nice isolation where you kind of look at your application as a process and, yeah. I don't wanna get into too much technical detail about uh, process jail, but think about it this way. Uh, you put up a Linux machine, process ID one is your init system, right? It's either init system or system D, that's the first process ID to boot up after the kernel. The kernel boots up and the first thing that comes up is PID1 and that's your init system. And then the init system will go into etc init.t and start bringing up all the services that need to come up on boot up, right? In Docker, uh, we are fooling your kernel into thinking that PID1 is your application, like your Apache or whatever, right? We're putting it in a jail. So if you go into your host virtual machine and did PSAUX, you would see this as process number 4,921, but inside the container, the same process ID is mapped as PID1. So you kind of put a nice jail around the application and you have good isolation now. You can't have things getting out of that box and talking to other things. So does that make sense? All right, okay, good. So in terms of resource sharing and noisy neighbor, um, has anyone uh, run Drupal in multi-site configuration, where you basically um, have one Drupal instance, and then in sites folder, you have a.com and b.com, right? Both of them running off of the same Apache, uh, right? And then you just have different, Drupal is going to look at the URL and decide which sites folder is gonna go into and serve the website, right? So in this, you can end up with what is called as a noisy neighbor problem. If a.com gets a lot of traffic, that's gonna take up all your Apache's resources in that b.com will now slow down, right? It's, it's just affected because they happen to share the same resources. In, Drupal, in, in Docker, you won't have this problem because they're both running in two different Docker containers and at the Docker system level, you can define what are called shares. You can allocate memory shares and CPU shares and the ways to throttle network and give allocated resources. So um, if, if a.com has a lot of web uh, traffic, uh, it might be slow for them, but b.com customers are still happy and, and they continue to see their pages in, in an acceptable time, right? So this, this is one of the main advantages of Docker, isolation. Uh, the other advantage I would say is uh, the way you ship uh, package and ship applications, right? Contrast that to a virtual machine, uh, a very crude way of looking at it is going to the virtual machine and do uh, git pull origin master, right? Like very crude, but yeah, it works, right? So contrast that to uh, Docker where uh, you take your entire application and the application stack, put it into what is called a Docker image, right? And then now you ship this Docker image and anyone who wants to run it can run it. Everything that needs to be run is inside that image. That includes your Apache, your PHP, your application, uh, Drupal, all the necessary, you know, uh, things that go with it is nicely packaged into one thing. Um, so I think the main innovation really is in the way Docker helps you ship applications. So here's some comparison between virtual machine and Docker. Uh, the main difference here being the hypervisor layer, right? So you have at the virtual machine, um, you have the host, host system, the hypervisor, and then you have various uh, 
guest operating systems on that, right? Typically, you don't run the host operating system. Um, Amazon runs it. Uh, you only get like one guest uh, or two or three, depending upon how much you bought from Amazon or AWS. Um, in contrast, uh, Docker, you don't use a hypervisor. You use a Docker engine, uh, which is built on top of a Linux kernel feature called cgroups, which lets you do this process isolation, right? It is basically fooling your process into thinking it is PAD1. And so it can't talk to anybody else. Puts you in a nice jail. Um, so, and then you have your own uh, sort of Linux inside your container. It's not really Linux. It's just fooling it into thinking it's a Linux. Uh, but it's all like running on the same kernel underneath. Um, so, um, how do you go about building a Docker image? This is one of the things you need to uh, get right early on um, if you want to do thousands of. Uh, Drupal sites, or even if you want to host your one Drupal site on Docker, right? You'll need a Docker file. Uh, so uh, that's a very simple syntax. Uh, it's its own um, language, uh, the Docker file syntax. Um, let's look at an example. You would start with a from image, right? So Docker images are built in layers, right? So you don't want to start with layer zero. You just want to start with something that's already built and it's a good configuration and it's popular and being used by a lot of people. You want to use that as your starting point and then you build on top of that. Um, that's the first statement. So we're using the official PHP and this is old, right? 5.6, don't use 5.6, please. Use 7.0 or 7.2, right? 7.2, all right, okay, yeah. Don't use 5.6, this is a very old presentation. Um, start with PHP um, 7.x, right? Um, and then on top of that, you want to run this command. Um, we are enabling the rewrite module because Drupal needs that for clean URLs. Um, and then you want to do apt-get update a whole bunch of packages that you need for Drupal to work, uh, for your Apache Drupal stack to work. So it's just like things like unzip and so on, right? Be MySQL client, you, you're going to need all of these things. Um, so every statement in this file is going to create a layer in your Docker image. So you started with PHP, uh, and then on top of that, the next layer was, uh, let me go back. The next layer enabled um, the rewrite module, right? So think of it as every layer is like, you run this command on this um, Linux machine, you take a snapshot of the hard disk, you look at the difference between what happened before and now, and only the difference you store as a layer, right? So it's just like snapshots of the file system and changes that happened over time. So we took a snapshot at the end of this statement, and we did this apt get update, apt get install, this 100 packages, and then you do a snapshot, you get like a 1,000 more new files. That becomes a new layer, and you keep adding to that, right? You install Composer, and using Composer, you install Drush, and then you want to use uh, Drush Make to go get all your Drupal modules that you want, right? now. This is all built on Drupal 7. Um, you would probably do it in Drupal 8, then you would use Composer for everything. But the concept is the same. Uh, you want to bootstrap your whole Linux, like, you know, you start with PHP, install Composer, and then use Composer to go get, go get all your packages, right? Um, somewhere you need to take your application source code and put it into the container. That's the first statement here. Copy everything in the current folder to where www, right? So you moved everything into your container. Now you're using Composer to install all the dependencies. Um, the last statement here is like um, very specific to our company. We don't like to call it where www HTML. We like to call it where www doc root. And then we're just creating a symbolic link from HTML to doc root. Um, that's just how our Git repo is set up. Yeah. Um, so. The Drush make file, uh, not going to touch on it. Drupal 8 does it in a different way using Composer JSON. Uh, not important. Uh, here's where things get interesting, right? So what, now you, we have a Docker uh, image that has our application, the Drupal site that we built with our custom modules and profile and everything. Uh, that's a Docker image, right? Now we need to reuse that for 6,000 customers. Right. How we're going to do that is by what is called injecting environment variables. Right. You don't want to put your MySQL password inside your container, or for that matter, you don't want to put any credentials inside your container. Right. Uh, it's not secure. You want to in inject it at runtime using environment variables. So when the Docker 
container is being brought up, you would say, hey, here's an environment variable for MySQL password, for MySQL username, here's a MySQL host, and here's a database name, and so on. You want to inject these. So what we are doing here is hacking settings.php, and instead of, usually if you go into, like let's say a typical Drupal 7 site, you'll see the password right there in clear text, right? Uh, what we are doing here is uh, we are replacing it with this set of lines where we say get it from the environment, right? So your username, your password, your host, uh, and your database name is gonna come from outside at a runtime. And the person who built the Docker image doesn't care about that. They just know that oh, it's, going, it's gonna be given to me at a later time, right? So when you build the image, you don't worry about that. Uh, you also get the base URL from outside because we're doing uh, a.example.com and b.example.com. Um, you want the cookie domain to be set because uh, you don't want a.com people to be logged into b.com. You want all logins at every uh, website to be its own thing. Um, so you set the cookie domain for the login to work correctly. And then you're good to build the image. Uh, very simple command, you do docker build minus t image. Uh, on a real uh, DevOps system, you would probably not run this command by hand. You would have uh, a continuous integration pipeline that builds it for you. Uh, you can talk to me about this later if you want to get more details about that. Um, so these are all manual commands that you would run to like log into Docker uh, Hub and push it. So we have the Docker image now, right? That represents Apache, MySQL client, uh, PHP, and our Drupal application, right? This whole image. You gotta go store it somewhere. So we all like, I'm guessing store uh, source code on GitHub. Uh, similarly, uh, a popular option to store Docker images is Docker Hub, right? You build the image and you go store it in Docker Hub. Uh, there are some free plans and there are some paid plans. Um, you can look at it and uh, choose one. Uh, there's, a, there's a competitor to Docker Hub called Quay.io, you can do that. Or you can run your own Docker registry. It's a little bit complex, uh, but you can do it. Uh, it's, it's the, the source code is open for that. You can run your own Docker registry if you want it and lock it down to your company. Uh, so other people don't get access to your image. Docker Hub, if you pay them, they'll give you private images. So even that is locked on, other people don't see your stuff. Um, so we have built a Docker image, we went and put it on Docker Hub, and uh, now we need to run thousands of these containers, right? Um, so we use a, a system called Rancher. Um, has anyone heard of Kubernetes? All right, okay, so Rancher is, uh, Rancher 1.0 came out uh, four months before Kubernetes uh, came out. So it was an option available to us back then, and it was generally available, and it was uh, much, much more easy to get started with than Kubernetes. So if anyone is interested in starting a Kubernetes cluster today uh, for playing with, I would highly recommend you check out Rancher 2.0. It is built on top of Kubernetes. They've completely thrown out their cattle engine and replaced it with the Kubernetes engine. So it's just Kubernetes with a really beautiful user interface and an API layer on top. Uh, do check it out. Uh, um, so Rancher is what is called as an orchestration system. So you're gonna have these thousands of containers running on let's say 70, 80 machines, right? Uh, virtual machines, uh, someone has to manage all of this. You can't go SSH into 80 machines and like bring up containers and shut down containers. It's just too much of a pain, right? So you leave it to a rancher to deal with it. So you have a rancher master, and then you have a host under that, right? You, you have like how many ever hosts, 50, 60, 70, whatever. Um, so then you would just talk to the master and say, go do this, and then the master would find like, oh, it looks like machine number 37 has extra disk space and CPU. Let me go put this container there. Right? So that's not a manual decision. You're just leaving up to Rancher to do it. Uh, right? So it's uh, got catalogs built in. So it's like apart from your Drupal image, Rancher has a lot of cool things that you can just one click launch. Uh, things like ClusterFS and Zookeeper and like a whole bunch of things now. The catalog has grown really large in the last uh, few years. And now that they're built on top of 2.0, uh, Kubernetes is 2.0 is built on top of Kubernetes. The whole catalog system they have reworked. Uh, it's now based on Helm chart. So if there's Helm chart out there, you could just take it and run it inside Rancher 2.0. Um, so we can skip over this. How to run your Rancher master uh, 
yeah, like you can look it up on the Rancher website. Um, okay, so let's just look at this. This is how you would add a stack, and once add a service, want a volume. Let me see if there's a good screenshot. No, there isn't. All right. So within Rancher, uh, they have these certain terminologies: a stack, a service, right? So uh, a stack would be a.com, and within that services would be Apache, MySQL, Memcache, and so on, right? That's for that stack, right? So you have all these services under that. Uh, this is how you add a stack. This is how you add a service, and this is where you inject your environment variables. So if you had to do it from command line, you'll have to do Docker minus e minus e minus e 20 times. Rancher gives you a nice web interface. Uh, to enter all your environment variables, right? So we've automated this process also over the last few years. Uh, I can talk about that later. So mounting volumes, right? Drupal has a files folder, right? And in a typical virtual machine situation, it's the files folder is on that virtual machine. Uh, but in a Docker container, you will have to bring this file system from outside because containers, you have to keep in mind, are not ephemeral. They are ephemeral in the sense that you can't expect that this container will run on this machine forever and ever, right? You should just assume that you can't make that assumption. It could move from this machine to that machine, right? Then what happens to the files folder? Like, are we going to move it or no? The better idea is to then have a network file system, have it mounted on all of the machines, and then mount that folder into the container, right? So what we're doing here is on the host machine, we have data for root 12, right? That's getting mounted into where www doc root sites default files. So when Drupal goes to that size default files, it is there, but the folder is not local to the Docker container. It's living on the underlying host. It's not even living on the underlying host. It's mounted on the underlying host. It's actually living in a network file system. We're using cluster. Uh, you can look at alternatives like uh, Amazon has Elastic File System. There are many ways of achieving this now. Um, the next thing, the most tricky thing in running thousands of websites is layer seven routing, right? So in our company, we have subdomains for all customers, sindu.com, let's say example.com, right? You have customer a.example.com, b.example.com, and so on and so on, like you know, 6,000 6, of these. So the tricky thing is to get the traffic to go to the right container, right? Uh, so this was an earlier architecture. We've changed how it works. Uh, what we do today is we use a cluster of console servers to store data about these 6,000 customers, right? Uh, the subdomain, the MySQL username, password, MySQL database name, MySQL host. These kind of, the, the ones you saw injected in the environment variable at settings PHP, right? This is stored in a console cluster and when the first hit comes in, uh, we have a front-end uh, reverse proxy server built on Nginx and a bunch of Lua scripts. So what it does is it looks at what URL do you want to view, right? Let's say the browser has requested a.example.com. Then this Lua script is going to take that A and then go to console and say, hey, give me all the details about A, right? And this is done over a REST API call uh, and console gives back all the data. And from that, we'll know uh, in rancher terms, what is the URL for that service? So let me go back a few steps. Um, I want to talk about rancher service discovery. Right, OK. So we created a stack, right, called Swarup 12. And then we added a service. Uh, we don't see a name here. Let's call it Drupal, right? Um, so that's a stack, that's a service. So rancher makes it discoverable using a URL um, of the syntax service dot stack dot rancher dot internal. That's the domain name, right? So it would be Drupal dot a dot rancher dot internal for a dot example dot com, right? So what we do then is at the Nginx level, uh, go to console, get the information, and then send it to uh, proxy pass it to the rancher URL, right? So you're basically going now, translating the URL a.example.com to um, a.example.rancher.internal. It's just think of it as a URL being rewritten, right, for internal traffic purposes. Now Rancher will be able to resolve that name to the correct container, and then you get your web page. And since you are a reverse proxy, customers don't see it in the browser. They just see a.example.com on the browser, right? We are reverse proxying all of this. 
So then you, the reverse proxy would return the HTML page back to the browser. So a lot of this uh, is mostly, if you want to think about at a very big level of how do you run thousands of Drupal sites, it's getting your settings.php parameterized instead of hard coding. And second, handling challenges at layer seven, uh, routing your traffic, right? Um, yeah, okay, so this is what I was talking about. This is Rancher Service Discovery. Um, and this is how the traffic flows through. Uh, this is all handled by Rancher. You don't need to worry about which machine it's running in, right? Um, if a machine goes down, Rancher is going to move the container to a healthy machine, and it's going to update the internal domain name to point to the new container's IP address. So you don't have to worry about any of these things. Rancher will handle it for you. Um, and it's going to read the URL too, to point to the new container where it moved, right? So you get really a uh, robust cluster. Like one machine goes down, no problem. Rancher is going to move the containers, rewrite the URLs to point to the new machine, new container, things are still up and running, right? You don't have to manually go in and hack things. Um, scalability, if you want to scale uh, on, in a virtual machine situation, you'll have to use like um, elastic scaling where you boot up a whole virtual machine, right, and pay for it and so on. Um, you just click this plus button here in Rancher. It's gonna bring up one more container, right? Um, yeah, I don't have a screenshot for that. So you can run how many containers you want for a particular service, Rancher will load balance that. So the first hit that comes in for a.example.com goes to container one, the second hit that comes in goes to container two, so it does a round robin, right? Uh, so you know, you, so it's not like, in terms of load balancing, you have all four containers equally distributed uh, with the load of the traffic that comes in, right? Very easy to scale, very easy to balance. Uh, compared to running a virtual machine and then like, oh, too much traffic, let's bring in one more virtual machine. And like, oh, now there's not enough traffic, let's shut down a machine, like, you know? Uh, yeah, you don't have to deal with it at machine level. It's much easier to do at container level. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is how we upgrade services, right? We have 6,000 customers and we do uh, four to five releases a week. Uh, that's our Drupal application, right? Including Drupal security patches that come on Wednesdays. Um, Security patches, how many of you are on the Drupal security list, uh, emailing list? Okay, if you're running Drupal in production, you should be on that email list, right? Look up, I think, drupal.org slash security. Yeah, sign up for the newsletter. Um, typical release windows are Wednesday, 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, if there's a change, they announce it before. Also follow them on Twitter, I think it's at Drupal security. Um, where's Neil, Neil, is that right? At Drupal security? Yeah, yeah. You can look it up on Twitter. Uh, there's also a Drupal Infra. Uh, you can follow both of these on Twitter to stay up to date on what's coming. Uh, make sure your Drupal modules and your Drupal core is up to date in terms of security. Uh, we've had a lot of hacks in the past. We had a Drupal Geron, Armageddon, Drupal Geron, yeah. Uh, that was a big mess, right? So stay on top of this every Wednesday. Make sure your application, if, if there's a security release that came out that Wednesday, uh, make sure you're up to date. Um, so when you run in a virtual machine kind of situation, again, it's a little painful to upgrade, but when you move into Docker, things get so much easier to upgrade, right? Um, so the way Rancher does this is, uh, I'm just gonna fast forward. Um, so you have a container running, let's say 1.3.12, right? And today you're releasing 1.3.13 of your particular application, right? You have a container that's running, it's gonna start a new container, and then you have now two containers running, serving traffic. It's possible that some customers are getting old version, some customers are getting new version, and then it's gonna shut down the old container, right? Rancher does this, uh, it's all one click, right? So it's very easy to do uh, in terms of upgrading, right? You just go in there and hit upgrade and put the new, uh, so when you build the Docker image, you would tag that as a version, right? Uh, you build the image and say this is 1.3.12, and this is 1.3.13. Right, you just go tell Rancher that this is a new version I have, and it's gonna do it in a seamless way that uh, doesn't drop that much traffic uh, in terms of people being served and so on, right? And it's a very, very easy uh, thing to do for developers, right? It's, once it's made easy to do, then you're motivated to do often, and so you know your security updates are done on time and promptly. So this is something we did internally to manage Rancher itself. So Rancher is good if you're going to, the user, the web interface is good if you're going to manage like four, five, six applications, right? But at like 6,000 applications, nobody has time to go into Rancher user interface. 
So Rancher has a nice um, HTTP REST API, and we built an application that calls Rancher API and does everything that I described. Um, so we do it at 6,000 level applications one click, and then our application goes and talks to Rancher 6,000 times and does the upgrade on that side. Uh, this is an internal uh, project we're doing. Um, so this was a very old architecture. We don't run thousands of containers. We used to run 5,000 containers. It's madness. Uh, we now run like seven, eight containers. Uh, we've done like a lot of cost optimization and we are able to handle traffic uh, with seven to eight containers at peak. Uh, yeah, um, I can talk a little bit more about that um, offline if you want. So I think that's about it. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, John, does we need a mic? We don't have John. Oh, there is John. Hang on, Eric. Is the microphone on? I think I'm on now. Um, how does it work with the uh, hybrid infrastructure? If you have on-prem and um, and you have something on say AWS, um, how does it? How do how do you manage like IP tables and? and uh, we don't. We are 100% uh, on the cloud. Uh, okay. But I don't see how it can't be done. Um, console, which is kind of the brains behind uh, how our layer seven routing works, uh, has a multi data data center architecture built into it. So you could have a console cluster in AWS and a console cluster on prem, and have them have the same encryption key so they can talk to each other. Right, and so at console level, uh, when you ask for a.example.com, console is going to decide this is in this particular IP address or this particular rancher environment, right? So you'll have one rancher environment in AWS and one in on-prem. So it will resolve to the DNS name that is in the correct data center. So console can do cross data center syncing of data, right? If a new application comes up on-prem, that information is updated in all the concept clusters across, right? So everybody knows about every application's uh, uh, IP address or rancher DNS name. This is something console propagates very efficiently. They have what is called as a gossip protocol. You should look it up, it's really cool. Um, instead of having a centralized information spreading architecture, they use a very decentralized approach, kind of like how gossip spreads uh, in society, right? So any machine is like, hey, did you hear a.example.com is running in this IP address? I was like, oh yeah, let me pass it on, right? So that's how it works. It's a really cool protocol, super efficient, and you don't have a single point of failure because information flows organically instead of like top down. Um, so if one um, application comes up in either your cloud or your on-prem, over the gossip protocol, it will spread to everybody and everybody will know the location of that application. And then when your Nginx will be able to reverse proxy to that right place. Did that, did that answer? But definitely check out console. Really, really cool project, uh, especially in service discovery space. Like discovering where a particular container is running, right? It's, it solves that in a very elegant way, cross data center, within data center, cross availability zones. Uh, very, very cool architecture. Eric had a question. Uh, so you, you, you went with Rancher 2.0. That, that was clear. When we are running 1.6. But oh, I recommend that that's what 1.6 1. is a competitor to Kubernetes in the sense they did their own orchestration engine called Cattle, right? Uh, think of it as a competitor to Kubernetes. Uh, this came out four months before Kubernetes came out. Uh, this is what we are running in production. But if anyone's starting out today, I would recommend just start with 2.0 that's built on Kubernetes. That's the direction you should be going in. Right. So that was my other question. So, so why, why Rancher instead of just Kubernetes? Right, um, your learning curve is much easier on Rancher. A lot of things is, uh, so for Kubernetes it's like, it's not a opinionated done for you system. You still have to go figure out a lot of things yourself and like, oh, how am I gonna do networking? Oh, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna do that, right? Whereas Rancher has all these parts figured out for you and, and it's opinionated in the sense you don't have to make choices. Um, it's all done for you and comes with a beautiful web interface. So you just go click, click, click and like, oh yeah, let me link my rancher to my Docker Hub credentials. Because you need to pull your private Docker images from somewhere, right? How are you gonna set that up, right? So those kind of things are done for you in rancher. It's like one click and you set up your link between rancher and 
Docker Hub. One click and you set up a link between Rancher and AWS credentials. So if it wants to bring up more machines, it can bring it up itself based on traffic. You don't have to go like click anything, right? right? So yeah, so the, the nice integrations done by Rancher for that. And there's a whole lot of things they have done for logging and so on. Yeah. Right, and, and, and Rancher is written in, is, is open it's written source, in Go. And, and, it's, and it's written, so if you wanted a feature that it didn't contain, you would just add it? Mm, no, you would write it as a Docker container and run it as a Docker container. So Docker has uh, two ways of running. Uh, one is a regular mode, one is a privileged mode. In a privileged mode, your Docker container has access to the host operating system and can do things at the host level, right? So if you're doing something at a very low level, you can run it as a privileged container, but don't hack Rancher. Write services on Rancher that achieve your purpose and write them as Docker containers and deploy them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's what I would uh, do, right? So one of the things we do is we run out of disk space a lot uh, because we keep pulling images and we're doing five releases a week and like, you know, we have this Drupal, and in our case, 1.3.10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, each of them is 700 MB, um, 800 MB images, right? We can start cleaning out these old images that we don't use anymore, right? So that's a, that's a nice service uh, somebody's written. Um, it's called Janitor. I think Rancher only wrote it, I'm not sure. But that runs as a container, a privileged container mm. on the host, right? So it's a container, but with administrative privileges. So it goes into the host machine, looks at the disk space, and sees, oh yeah, these are old images, nobody's using them. Let me delete these images and free up some disk space, right? So you want to extend, extend it on top, not below, mm -hmm. right? Run a service on top of Rancher, right? Good. Yeah. Good, great, thanks. Uh -huh. That was another question. Very nice talk, Money. Uh, Thank you. As, as, as a trained economist, uh, uh, so my, my, my thinking goes about charging customers. So, I mean, you not only need to distribute the, the, the resources, but you also need to, 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 to keep track of who is using what so that the, the customer who pays, the, you use more actually pays more. Is that the case? What we are a SaaS product. We just have a flat fee. And oh. we kind of like, so you can think of it as where some customers cross subsidize some customers, right? Uh, depending upon usage. So we have a flat, what we charge the customers is flat. On, on the infrastructure side, maybe one, we pay more for one customer, but not so much for another customer. Uh -huh. uh, that's something we don't, uh, we don't let the customers worry about. That's just how our, our profit margin works internally, right? Uh -huh. So that's something we don't solve. But having said that, um, Rancher has a lot of community projects that let you uh, track uh, metering uh, for containers. Uh, yeah, I, I can't think of any, but there are definitely some community projects that let you do metering on a per customer basis. But um, having said all of that, let me plug uh, John Pugh's project. He's doing something really cool um, in terms of uh, multi-tenant uh, systems. Uh, check out DevShop. Uh, he has something really, really cool cooking. If you want to run Drupal uh, environments, uh, right, uh, and have multiple customers running in your shared environment, right, uh, definitely check out his work. Jacob, are you ready? More questions? Thank you, Mani. All right, thank you. And goodbye. Goodbye. Do you have slides or? I have a Google Doc, but I actually wrote it out. Um, and you know what, I, I mean, I don't mind. Oh, Plug it in and see what happens, but it's yeah. been blinking. I'm not going to move it much, and that might help. Or it just hates us. Oh, and this is no Never good. Okay. We're not recording this, are we? working, just give it a second.
Yeah, it's, it's picking up. It's connected. Yeah, that should kick over. Okay. But then I... Not slides, that's the problem. All right. You know what? Um, no, I'll just talk. In, I mean, I just have a Google Doc, so I'm actually organized on my thoughts, and I don't mind. Uh, some things are linked, but... Because um, I don't have slides, so it's forwarding and scrolling, and I was going to open up some documents, and I can just quote some of the documents. Uh, that's Manny's. All right, we're giving up on this. On the, all right. So I kind of wanted to talk about uh, the future of Drupal, Drupal 8. Um, in a specific reaction I'm having to like recent threads on Reddit, which are kind of fascinating. Like, uh, I'll first start off by saying Reddit is like the bottom of the barrel of discussions. Um, it's like where the trolls go to complain. At the same time, you have to listen to these conversations and try to get out, you know, what people are complaining about, what people's hesitations are, what their concerns are. And then some people try to weigh in and defend Drupal. Um, and to just take a step back before I get more into detail is about me. Like, I, so I'm the maintainer of the web forum module. My name's Jake Brockwitz. Um, I am heavily invested in Drupal. I want to state like my opinions before I start talking about this. It's heavily invested in Drupal, value the community. Um, I like building big and complex things like the web form module. I'm not as interested in the newest, latest, shiny thing. I don't have a problem with doing something that just works and is stable and reliable. And I see a lot of technologies come and go quickly and some are here to stay. And Drupal has been here to stay for over 10 years. Um, <coughs> And this is a funny, honest statement about Drupal is enterprise clients pay more. Um, Drupal has a higher price point for a salary than WordPress developers. Drupal developers just make more. It's just the stats on how they break down because they're targeting larger clients. Um, I kind of want to ask a general question, like who's new to Drupal? I I'm going to do the question, you know, that I hate those, but it's like, who's new to Drupal? Show of hands. Who is experienced in Drupal and is using Drupal? Okay, who's experienced in Drupal? Assume that's everyone else. Who's using Drupal 7 only? And who's moved on to Drupal 8? So it's like half, like half and half. Um, oh, I have no power. So to, to kind of talk about Drupal 8 and kind of give a background, there's a couple of blog posts that I was going to pull up, and they're not, the titles help enough to describe it, because there's the first one, I think the most important draw, blog post about setting the stage for Drupal 8 is Dries wrote a post that, you know, was called Drupal is for ambitious digital experiences. This happened at Baltimore three years ago as Drupal 8 was coming out, or maybe it was even before that he did a keynote, and wanted to make the point that Drupal's changed. It's about building large, I mean, for me, I think it's really about building enterprise websites. But ambitious is a nicer way of saying we're building large, complex user experiences. And I like to, in parentheses, say, basically saying, don't use Drupal to build a blog. Um, and if you go a step further, it's use WordPress instead. Uh, at the same time, some other people wrote blog posts where they asked, like, Drupal, we need to talk. What's the future of Drupal here? People are not adopting Drupal 8 as fast as we wanted. There's an issue. People are afraid to move to it. Um, at previous next, I wrote a blog post. You know, have we reached peak Drupal? Have we reached? Because the stat—it's very important. Like, there's this in all these different threads, especially on Reddit. People are looking at the stats of Drupal, and the summary of the stats is they're flat for the past three to four years. And initially, when Drupal 8 came out, it was assumed they were to remain flat because people would be hesitating to go to Drupal 8 while Drupal 7 is still out. But now that Drupal 8's been out for a while, the stats are not going up on Drupal. It sits at about a million installations. And with a lot of the contributed modules, they're staying pretty flat, and some of them are going down. Um, and even tied to that, an honest stat that they're not releasing is Drupal cons are pretty flat with the attendance. At DrupalCon US, it's about 3,000. They stopped. This is just an interesting statement about 
the DA, nothing to pick on them too much. But at the end of DrupalCon, they're not actually talking about those stats anymore. They used to say, we've got you know, 4,000 people at this conference, and they kind of don't mention it. But it's, a, it's, it's, it's flat. Um, and I actually wrote a blog post defending Drupal because I kind of take this approach. I titled the blog post, Drupal is the worst CMS um, except for all those other solutions. And I kind of was defending Drupal in the sense of we're able to do really complex, rich things with an awesome community that helps people, and we don't have paywalls blocking you from getting access to open source code, which is a really important difference between Drupal and WordPress. Is everything in Drupal is free. There's no such thing as a paid module. Versus in WordPress, and specifically in the space that I'm in with form builders, every aspect of the form builder that you might want to enable, they ask you to pay $35. Um, and that's just not how Drupal works. Drupal's about, we're all going to work together and build the best system we can. And Reddit recently had two threads where, you know, well, Dries wrote a blog post about Drupal's long-term growth obstacles. How do we make people adopt Drupal and make it grow? And out-of-the-box experience has been a big thing, is making it easier for people to get started with Drupal. There's a new theme called the Umami, which is a base starter theme that just gives you a better user experience. And they made it a little easier to get a local server of Drupal running in like two commands versus 35 steps. Um, I'm actually going to unplug this from, my screen keeps flickering because that thing keeps going. So leave it plugged in because keep in mind I'm reading it. That's what's throwing me off. Uh, all right. So Dries wrote a blog post about long-term growth obstacles and how to get over them. I, I, what I like about Dries, the project lead of Drupal, is he has good analogies sometimes to compare. And he compared how Amazon set up decided, figured out that shipping was their biggest obstacle to growth, and that's why they set up Amazon Prime and took a huge loss on it, but felt that that would push them over this obstacle of getting people used to shipping and comfortable with it and getting packages give, delivered in two days, and it worked. That, like, Amazon Prime is the, helped Amazon grow huge. Every household kind of purchases this and now gets their packages in two days, and they've got to figure this out for Drupal. Um, so Reddit had a thread. So this is where I wanted to show the threads because they're just fascinating. And we're not going to see it. But people just start grumbling <laughs> about the complexities of Drupal. Down to it's so much harder to do things. Showing code snippets and saying in Drupal 7 it was only, I, I love this one that I wanted to show on screen because it basically, the argument was, I'm not getting it on the screen, so I'll just give you, yeah, you could, yeah, I could share that. I can, I can wing it. I'm, o I'm okay enough to be like, they're basically saying in Drupal 7, it was one file with 100 lines of code, and Drupal 8 had seven files to create a menu, a callback, just a simple page that someone would go to. And they're complaining about it. And personally, I looked at it, and I said, they're not getting the other benefits of breaking things up into smaller files. I mean, it's a, I'm just going to step back from a programmer's perspective. When you're building complex things, when you break it into smaller pieces, it's easier to understand. This is a best practice. Instead of lumping things into one giant file, if you can abstract things into smaller components, it's easier to go in and customize them and understand. It's even easier in your Git commits to know what the hell's going on, because if you change one of the seven files that's relevant, like the title of the page, it's easier to get there and know what, what happened. Um, so, Go back. I mean, that was, so people, the general, the threads in Reddit were good. The Drupal's too complex. It's also, there's another underlying grumbling is um, the direction has changed to be more enterprising. People were hobbyists using Drupal and they resent the direction that Drupal's going in. They feel left behind. They feel decisions were made that they weren't included on in terms of where Drupal was going in the architecture. And I can, there's some specific decisions that were made. And what, what helps to kind of explain this grumbling is to be like, what are the big differences between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8? So I have six bullet points, and these are mine, and I ho hopefully some people might want to weigh in if I'm missing something. There's less Drupalisms in between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. 
in Drupal 7, there was a lot of custom ways that people were doing things in Drupal that no one else in the entire software community ever does it this way. So someone outside of Drupal coming in is totally baffled on what a hook is, or how it works, or how you set up a menu callback, um, or even how you do templates. It was all this custom stuff that Drupal was doing. Even as simple as how to make an HTTP request from one server, a Drupal server, to another server was all custom code. And in Drupal 8, they went and found Guzzle, which is the amazing library to make simple HTTP requests, and started using that. They, got, they called it getting off the island and trying to leverage the best practices of the software community. So that's my, you know, wow, I keep flickering, guys. It's okay, it makes it even more challenging. <laughs> Along with these best practices, like getting, starting to follow best practices, Drupal 8 is more object-oriented than Drupal 7. It is, I would argue, 80% object-oriented and the remaining 20% is some legacy code that's floating around. I gotta just be honest, when people say Drupal 8's object-oriented, that's not 100% true. 80% of it's object-oriented and there's still some functional code floating around in there. Um, and just tied to that, I mean, see, we're not, you know, most people are familiar with Drupal. Symphony was adopted. That's another big thing of getting off the island and taking a best practice. I like to call out another big thing for Drupal. Views in core, I think, is a big thing because it represents something. It represents Drupal saying, we're going after enterprise customers and taking modules that were in contrib that are really, really important and bringing them into core and saying these are supported. We're trying, and, and views in core represent, and, and the CK editor coming into core was bringing things into core that make it competitive with other enterprise solutions. And for me, that argument with Drupal 8 is a really strong one. And that's like even the future and the initiatives of Drupal are all tied to that. Um, another example would be Twig improving templating. And the last big difference I think is performance is, I personally think performance is a lot better in Drupal 8 because of caching that they went after solving one of the most difficult things in programming, which is caching things properly and invalidating them, and solved it. I mean, that's like an incredible accomplishment. Um, by the way, I like that my differences all go toward really what's great in Drupal 8, not what's um, good in Drupal 7. It's hard for me to defend Drupal 7 because I feel like Drupal 8 is the future. Um, to play the, the flip side, because I mean, there's a lot of great things in Drupal 8, the things in Drupal 7 that are great is there's a huge amount of contributed modules available, like 10,000 supported modules that have been used for seven years. So they're stable, they're reliable, you install them, they work, they've been reviewed. That is a huge perk um, in Drupal 7. Also, there's better documentation and better discussions on it. And ironically, some of the Drupalisms help force people to write better documentation for certain things. So if you need anything done in Drupal 7, you could type into Google, I'm trying to create a menu, callback, and you'll get 10 blog posts that summarize every aspect of it. Um, so I think going from the benefits of Drupal 7, I'm kind of saying, okay, so what sucks about Drupal? Because this is like, we got an overall arching thing. Because people are having an issue with Drupal 8, but it kind of goes, I think that transcends issues in Drupal across the board. Um, I have the great diagram of Drupal's incredibly complex learning curve. Um, it's just that, it's like a cliff. Like, you can start getting Drupal to work pretty easily, but when you try to get to more complex things, the learning curve is incredibly steep to get up to that point where you feel like you're an expert in Drupal. You have to know all these different nuances in Drupal 7 and 8. Um, I think these are the big ones that are hurting Drupal 8 adoption. Migration, because you have to redo your site, period. There's no gray area there. From 7 to 8, you have to rebuild the whole thing from scratch. Um, and you have to retrain your team to be able to do that. Like, they have to relearn everything they know about Drupal and start, not from scratch, but start from a very new point. People are resistant to change. Documentation, there's no great Bible for Drupal 8 in my opinion right now. I've looked at a couple of the books, but in Drupal 7 there were some books that were like Bibles. Like the pro Drupal development book was canonical and covered everything and you could kind of understand it. Um, 
there's a problem with quality assurance in Drupal overall. Um, I think it's coming to a head in, in Drupal 8 is because you're doing releases. Now we're doing a six month release cycle, so we make little changes and we publish them. And then we have regressions that are happening. And the QA is just this huge issue in the Drupal community. I see it in the web form. It has a lot to do with we really like building our shiny things, but we don't want to test them. And because people aren't paid, they're not as incentivized to test them. Like, even in the web form, I have a problem testing everything. No, a lot of people just get the feature they want and they move on. They won't do the QA. Um, the DA, like, Dries and I think the, the Drupal board put out a notice to try to get agencies involved to do better QA in the Drupal release process. But this, it really does hurt the adoption because people get frustrated especially if you break someone's site or, you know. I can't say we've lost people's data, to be honest. I think we've just created frustrating moments where, like, Ajax stops working for others. Um, the other thing with Drupal is it's hard to say who the audience is, and that hurts um, the community a lot because is it site builders? Is it site owners? It's not hobbyists anymore. It's not someone doing something small. Is it enterprise organizations? Um, is it small organizations? Is it the shops that are building Drupal sites? And that's, you know, there's a lot of shops that will, they're the gatekeeper of Drupal. They take a Drupal and they build their client site and the client has no idea it's even Drupal in many cases. They just hear the keyword and it's about the agency. Um, So let's see, where am I? I have two, by the way, I'm, you know, I created a bullet list that you can't really see in the outline, but, you know, I kind of, when I was doing this, I was going back and forth between different points because I kind of want to, I don't want to abandon Drupal 7. I don't want to say, like, we, you know, what's the future of Drupal? You abandon Drupal 7. That's just not a realistic approach. So the question really, to step back and move away from Drupal 8, what's the future of Drupal 7? Well, it's very important that everyone here is on Drupal 7 know that, November 2021, that's the end of life for Drupal 7 being supported by the community with free security updates. Enterprise, other companies might step in and provide security updates, but by 2021, it's recommended you get off of Drupal 7 and move to Drupal 8. Um, sadly, I don't think that's a realist, I mean, it's realistic that we have to set that deadline, but people are going to go different places. Um, there's two ways to go right now. It's Backdrop, which is like a fork of Drupal, which is a completely viable solution and the absolute best way to go if you're a small site using Drupal 7 because you will get a supported user experience that keeps going and it has lots of functionality that you would expect without breaking backwards compatibility. Um, it's important to emphasize that like we have proven in Drupal 6, like so Drupal 6 is end of life, but there are lots of sites on Drupal 6, you can still see the stats, and my drop wizard is the one that I'll bring up. It's a company that's provided long-term support for Drupal 6, and basically when there's been a security release of Drupal 7, within, <laughs> within about five minutes, they have a backport to Drupal 6, and you pay them for it, but they also, they're a good company, and that backport's open source, and you can get to it if you need to. Um, with, so going back to the Drupal 8 is why is the adoption slow? We've talked about migration, complexity, the retraining. And I, I'd like to throw out there with the retraining, I almost want this to be a question that I would love people's opinion on because I'm slowly reaching the point because I deal with people in like the web form issue queue that have no experience with PHP something breaks and they're really frustrated and can't apply a patch to their site. And I'm slowly of the mindset that you can't build a Drupal site without some developer or paid support looking over your shoulder to help you. It's just how the community is set up where it's complex. And if you run into a problem, you can't just assume that someone like me for free is going to solve your problem that minute at that time. I will write a patch, or you can write a patch, and we could solve that problem pretty quickly. And if you actually have some knowledge of PHP, you can go on to one or two forums and get a solution really quickly. I can't, like I'm emphasizing this frustration because I'm kind of saying, you need a PHP person on your team. And if you had that, it's ridiculous what you can get done. Um, 
And that's a real problem in, in, in the adoption because people are really frustrated. In Drupal 7, I don't feel like that was the case. It wasn't that complex and you could kind of get away with installing a certain set of modules and it's working. I mean, the, a, a great example is like the rules module in Drupal 7 is completely stable. The, just that anyone doesn't know what it is. It just allows you to set conditions, rules that will trigger when certain behaviors happen on your site. Someone fills out a form, hits submit, and email gets sent out. This is ridiculously stable in D7. Like this is an awesome system for a site builder. You know nothing about code or anything. You can actually do almost anything with this module. It's not stable for D8. You should not be using it unless you know how to apply a patch. Because it's not. It's an alpha releases. Um, so it's a real big issue with D8 is this adoption, the, the level of skill, retraining. And, and the final one with Drupal is like there's competition out there. And we have to admit that there's competition and target people that should be using Drupal and shouldn't be using Drupal. I mean, the, you should not be using Drupal for your own blog. I don't use Drupal for my own personal website. I was actually rejoiced when I got off, off of Drupal for my own site. And I went to like a Strikingly, which is like Wix, and I pay them and they take care of everything. And I just have to write a blog post and I stack my little containers like a gut, gut, like I stack my containers using a page builder. I don't have to think about anything and it's great. Um, and there's just a lot of, you know, WordPress is definitely has a certain market. I, I mean, and just a quick WordPress versus Drupal because I actually talked about it in my blog post is, you know, WordPress is huge. It owns 30% of the web, smaller sites. They're getting more enterprise, but they're missing the tier that Drupal's at. And um, one of the big things that I'll throw out there with Drupal is security. Like that, just like Drupal, we have security the best that you could possibly have in open source because we have a security team. We have people thinking about it. And they're finding issues and talking about it. Meanwhile, in WordPress, it's very scattered. Each individual piece of WordPress has their own kind of security. I've seen some really bad, you know, because you, you don't have a centralized team looking at it. It gets inconsistent and you get vulnerabilities. Um, I'm at 28 minutes, which is not too shabby. All right. Just look at the positive with Drupal 8. And then we can start talking about questions. Is uh, I was watching Dries' presentation at Acquia Engage. And I didn't really talk about Acquia much, but so Acquia is like, you know, the enterprise company overseeing Drupal in some weird way. They're not. They're not in charge of the Drupal project, but they're the biggest company supporting Drupal. Um, the comparison of Acquia would be how Red Hat is to Linux, Acquia is to Drupal. And Acquia is a huge investment with different people working on different aspects of Drupal. I see them in the community all the time. Everyone's great at Acquia that's in the core team. I mean, they're doing things. Anything that you rejoiced recently that you saw in Drupal happen, Acquia's had some play in it by hiring someone who's working for, you know, like Aqua is paying someone to contribute that back to core. Like the example would be the media builder. I've seen the developers. It's a the media library. Um, and, and with that, so Aquia, little notes about Aquia is Aquia's business is a lot of different hosting. Services is a huge thing. There's this open source. You can make money off of providing services, and that's where Aquia makes a lot of their money doing. Um, by the way, this is not a pitch for Aquia. <laughs> I hate when I see presentations that do that. But I want to explain the context of where like D8 stands. This is really important. Acquia is driving a lot of D8. They have a huge investment, but they make their money off their services around D8. And Acquia does an engaged conference where they talk about Acquia products. But what I thought was a huge takeaway, and Dries, the leader of Drupal, who's the CEO, CTO of Acquia, made this statement. I thought it was really important about Drupal. Is It's the only CMS that provides the ability to scale from small sites to large sites. He didn't say it like this, but for enterprise organizations. Because yes, I just said don't use uh, Drupal to build a blog. But if you're a giant media company and you need to build 500 blogs that are well controlled, well thought out and secure, yeah, you should use Drupal for that scalability. You could use WordPress, but Drupal, you can take, you can build hundreds of small sites and then scale them up to massive sites. And he goes on to bring up the cost is more reasonable at that because the problem is if you're using Aqua Engage and you build 300 small sites, 
You're paying 300 small software. You're paying like 300 enterprise software license. Where in Drupal, it doesn't work that way. Once you're in it, you can build whatever you want. Um, and it just scales better. And I really, it sat with me as like, when you see that he's seeing it that way, it start, the pieces of the puzzle of where Drupal's going start to fall into place. Small to large, when you look at the initiatives, they start to line up with that. And is pushing a lot of them, but they start to make sense. And I, I mean, I had a personal conversation with Dries and he just posed the question, what's the future of content management systems? And when you ask that question as you start looking at things, like headless Drupal is a big one. Um, for anyone not tech, headless Drupal is this idea that you would have Drupal to author your content, but then you could have all these APIs and that content can go anywhere. If you look at content management systems and think of the future, that is the future of all content management systems, period. It's just, it's kind of a given because things have gotten so complex, we need to decouple how we're organizing our data and how we're presenting it. And front end builders, front end site builders are so happy by that because they can go off and do React and whatever they want. And what's also ironic is front end technologies keep evolving a lot faster than back end. So Drupal will become a more stable backend and front end in a headless system can go off on their own. Um, with that said, there's still attention to the fact that some people still need to build websites and they need to think about things like media, layout. Um, so there's still, you know, like Drupal's going in all these directions, but they all, you know, like this goal of making Drupal a well-rounded system that goes in all these different ways I think is ambitious, but it makes sense. Um, so what's, what's the future of Drupal 8 and how are we gonna help it? Or is this even a problem? Do we even care? I mean, one thing I'll throw out in my mind, I keep trying to justify this slow adoption of Drupal 8. I try to fantasize that, well, for every, you know, the, st the stats are flat. And I personally see people coming onto Drupal every day. I see new registrations on a weekly basis. In the web form issue queue, I'd say I see on average three or four per week of literally people who have just started using Drupal, logged in, created their account, posted their first issue. So there are people coming into the community, but there must be people going out of the community. And my only optimistic hope when I say something like that is that for every like you know site we lose, it's a small hobbyist site and we're gaining one giant enterprise site. I don't know how realistic that is, but that's one take on it. Um, there is an initiative to improve the marketing of Drupal. Um, I, I'm starting to write blog posts about this whole concept of marketing and open source because this has got to be the big, this big issue in our communities. We don't think about it. We just write the code and we assume it's all fine and dandy. But Drupal needs to better market itself. I, I, I'm all open to saying that everyone in open source needs to better market themselves if we want things to be more sustainable. So it's, and, and you know, just getting into this blog post I'm, I'm working on, but it's like, you've got to, you know, understand your customer, give them a message, tell them what you're selling them, provide messaging and support, and, and you know, get a better communication with them. That's a very broad statement, but. Um, that's about, I'm going to stop there and say, you know, what are people's opinions, questions? Can we have a discussion here? Threw out a lot of stuff here. Yeah. Uh, we could. I, I mean, I barely use this microphone. Okay. Go. I think it's. Ent I mean, I. I think like that we're not in the community. We're not putting a number on this, but it's like enterprise sites. Like the target demographic is like people needing to build complex websites with more than just, I, I throw it out there with the headless stuff, it's more than just a website. It's more than just information, it's interaction. It's, I think interaction is a big part of it because, you know, I'll throw out, you need, you might want, you know, like the groups module where you're building communities or, the com I mean, commerce is a, by the way, commerce I didn't even talk about, but this is a very tricky one in the Drupal space because we have Drupal commerce, but then, uh, you know, there are third-party commerce packages that are being offered with Drupal. Like you build your Drupal site and then you move over to Magento. Um, I mean, I one demographic that I think is hands down perfect, government, period. 
government needs Drupal. I think government has recognized that. We see that in the Drupal 8 adoption, that it's very strong, because they need secure, scalability, cheap, you know, that they can get everyone on the same platform. Um, and it's worked out well for them. Education kind of falls into that. Businesses, it's tricky. Is that a fair? I mean, think about what, what, what other enterprise sites are you thinking about? That's the one I was just about to go there and I'd be like, I don't know. That media is a tricky one because it's like, do you want to do your magazine website in Drupal? Is it the right, you know, magazine sites seem like media companies sometimes are very spread out. You know, like media companies should use WordPress for their blog. You know, and then they maybe have a different site for their publication. It's a really tricky. And by the way, New York Times is like, I don't know what they're on. I think they're on completely custom. A completely custom CMS. I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and like a similar one would be like NPR. I think is still on their custom. You know, because they have such special needs that they're like, well, let's just get our data organized and then we'll build out the custom apps as we need. Um, other questions or feedback? Yeah, I just want to add to that. Um, I wish Alex Ross was here. He would have spoken about NBC and how they use Drupal eight uh, in yeah. many of their internal. Uh, I uh, used to work here. Uh, I worked on Telemundo.com. Mm -hmm. um, that was Drupal 7. I'm pretty sure they, they're doing a lot of migration projects now. Yeah. So you, if you catch Alex next month, definitely ask him about that. No. So the I, as far as I know, and I left three years ago, uh, that's a third party um, service with like a Drupal skin on it. Uh, I may be wrong. I, I mean, one statement about everyone who's moving from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 should evaluate other CMSs. It's just a given. We create. We just created this problem in the community where it costs a huge amount to migrate. So if you're going to spend all this money, you should make sure you're going to get the benefits that you're expecting from it. And we, I think we're losing people because of that. Maybe sometimes justified. It's not so much a question, more of an observation. I think mm -hmm. to your earlier point, I think you're right. As it moves more up the stack, Drupal, I think the pie is going to get smaller. And so I'm sure that's probably why, you know, to your point, like some of the sites are bigger, but maybe we're not doing as many. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I've seen in the market is, you know, as Drupal moves up the stack, uh, I think development companies need to be more cognizant of the other CMSs that are out there and their connected framework between the user personalization, all of those things. So like if you go and see a demo of AEM or Sitecore, mm. like personalization is built into the engine. You know, AEM has a whole marketing stack that sort of, you know, as they pitch more to the marketer and what's sort of running beneath the covers mm -hmm. becomes more important to them. I definitely see that as, as one of the elements and where an agency that might be sort of like a quote Drupal shop doesn't necessarily always pitch the connected Marketo or Salesforce integration. It's more of just sort of a site build type implementation. Yeah, uh, two things on that one is integration, I think is huge. like Salesforce is a great, I know Salesforce. Salesforce integration for Drupal 8 is amazing and save people a ridiculous ton of money. Yeah. Um, just a quick explanation on that statement. Uh, Salesforce chart for each API connection, you pay a licensing fee. So. If you had 100 apps out there managing data, you pay 100 licensing fee. Drupal provides a framework where you use Drupal as the central repository for data. It has one <coughs> license connection to Salesforce. Your data goes into Drupal and then it goes into Salesforce. And you've just saved a ton of money in terms of scalability. And that data is perfectly integrated into your Drupal site. And that's what the, sales, the Salesforce module for Drupal 8 is amazing. It yeah. takes all that data out of Salesforce Makes it if you connect Drupal in the right way, yeah. it's 90 times more powerful than any of those other systems. Mm. It's just the know-how of not only knowing Drupal 8, but knowing how Marketo integrates with yeah. and how Salesforce also. One other comment is just, you know, the relationship between Drupal and Acquia, I think is also That's a very, you know, Acquia, it definitely does services, but they also do products. And mm -hmm. ever since I think they've moved a, f a forward momentum in the product space and being more of an experiential play yeah. rather than just, hey, we help you host better. Uh, you know, they're into sort of their, I think it was that rocket ship, you know, 
they're the also lift. getting into yeah. the lift and personalization. You know, I wonder how, especially from a customer buying perspective, that and uh, that it's you know has, has uh, dealt with sort of the uh, plateau between. I mean, I kind of appreciate Aqua's strategy, and I think it works. Because I'm just going to throw out like Lyft is a good example. So Aqua offers a service for personalization, and yeah, I, I mean Drupal's like there, and Aqua is offering this other tier above it, right. and I, it might make a lot more sense for enterprise customers to be like, we trust Aqua's add-on to manage our data. It would almost be like, I mean, that analogy: would you put your money in the bank or in someone's house? You know, like like. Drupal, there's a limit to how much trust you can have in open source. And versus Acquia is doing this closed system that's in there, you know, it's just a service. And it's enterprise, it's targeted, it's not trying to do things. I, I, it, I yeah, I don't and see. Once you start to go down that path, then you start to see some of these things that are coming in that are almost like general applications that are trying to do things that are not really Yeah. I don't do Sidecore, but. Um, I even run into that with certain aspects like, um, oh, mailing list management. I would never use Drupal to manage mailing lists. You plug Drupal. Yeah, Drupal, the community needs to figure out these integrations. Even in web form, I'm thinking about making a push for more integration, like sponsoring integrations and being like, okay, guys, you need to fix this. Because that's the strength of Drupal, like our integrations and our ability to adapt really quickly. Any other... But yeah, it was more of a comment. And it's what you were just talking about at the end, too, and some of what you guys were just talking about is what I've noticed in a lot of the Drupal 8 builds that I work for an agency. And the things that clients are asking us to do are a lot of custom integrations with third party things like SSO integrations mm -hmm. and like uh, Nimble AMS is another thing which is built on top of Salesforce. So I see that as if Drupal is built in a way that makes it really easier quicker relatively to other systems to integrate with these kinds of tools, it gives Drupal a real advantage over anything else. And that is something that I think would keep driving Drupal forward if it's if it's better able to, to make these integrations. Because that's where like a bulk of the hours that we estimate mm -hmm. and that we end up doing the work for these projects come from. That's why companies are paying us is to do that. And if Drupal makes it easier, then you know Drupal's gonna stay strong from that. Yeah, I mean, I'll weigh in on that a little bit. My experience with integrations, I get killed on authentication. I've never given an estimate without saying, I don't know how authenticate. Like, people say we have OAuth, and then does is it going to work the way we expect it? Like, I can't say it's going to take five hours. I'm like, it could take five, it could take 20 to figure this out. In Drupal, what I do think is amazing, like the Sony API is awesome. Like, it's so simple to explain to someone that you can get data in and out of Drupal so easily in this standardized format and that if the community can keep evolving it like it'd be great if we could build nice swagger APIs off of that and that help with the integration I agree when we get into this third party abstract custom stuff we suck writing custom code um, and we're not really coming up with patterns that make it faster so I don't feel like we've got agile um, anything else or That's right, so that was it. Anybody else want to talk? <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Uh, the other party, as you may have seen, is up there. Just follow the people. That's a very bad map. Uh, but uh, I guess we'll go early. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to go home anytime soon. Yeah. Well, you can't for another hour, but you know. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Thank you.